<laughs> the beast will make off with your children. He'll come after them in the night. No! No one will be safe until his head is mounted on my wall. The solution to your problem is quite simple. The only way to get what you want is to become human yourself. Drive away your worries and cares at this drive-in theater, where you will see the finest motion pictures of all time, soon to be released. Hello, I am C-3PO Human Cyborg Relations. Welcome aboard the Star Speeder 3000. W. Your information station. Hello, my friend, and welcome to the WW Radio Show, your Walt Disney World information station. I am your host, Lou Mangiello, and this is show number 704. And together, as we have been for nearly 18 years, we're going to celebrate the magic of the Disney parks, movies, Marvel, Star Wars, and more here on the podcast, my weekly live video on Facebook every Wednesday night, events, blog, and more. Please be sure to join the community, subscribe to the podcast, invite a friend to listen, and find everything else at www.radio.com. Please join me as we continue our musical journey through the Disney parks this week as we tour Disney's Hollywood Studios. In the first part of our virtual visit, we're going to talk about the overall feel and theming of the park and how the music plays such an integral part, the changes over the years, and travel from the park entrance down Hollywood and Sunset Boulevards, looking at and listening to the background themes, stories, and why. Then stay tuned for our Disney trivia question of the week, more updates, and your voicemails at the end of the show. And if you like what you hear, please share the show and tell a friend. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode of the WW Radio Show. to Walt Disney World is an experience that touches all five senses in 360 degrees. It's not just about what you see, touch, smell, taste, and feel, but also, and in some cases almost more importantly, it's what you hear, because the sounds of the parks help to set the stage and tell the stories, from the natural ambient sounds to effects, dialogue, and of course, the music. Whether it's a theme song or background melodies, music is vitally important to the Disney storytelling experience. And we've explored music in the parks on past episodes of the series much longer ago than I thought it was, including it's back on show 601 and 602, The Music of Magic Kingdom, on 609 and 610, part one and two of The Music of Epcot, Future World, and on show 626 and 627, the Music of World Showcase, Parts 1 and 2. And in the past, we've broken down our analyses land by land and sometimes even song by song, discussing the music, backstories, composers, singers, and creators, as well as why certain music was chosen to be used in certain places. We've also shared our own sense of nostalgia and memories and how the music helps to immerse us in the lands and attractions and the emotional components to the music as well. And so we're going to continue our journey through the Walt Disney World parks this week as we virtually explore the music of Disney's Hollywood Studios. And joining me on this melodious odyssey is, back again, Lisa Donato Glasner from The Castle Run. Welcome back. Hey, I'm so, so glad to be back for this cool topic. And back again on the show is Will Magalio. You may remember him and his family from show 529 and our live review of Olivia's at Old Key West. Will, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Lou. It's so nice to be able to take part in this episode. I'm so excited. And thank you. Nice to meet you, Lisa, as well. So Lisa joined me on the music of Epcot, the Future World and World Showcase show, and begged and bribed 
to join back again on this one. But Will also pled his case a lo- nearly two years ago, like why he wanted to be on it. And you wrote me this wonderfully long, very compelling email about why you are the man to be on this Disney's Hollywood Studios episode. So briefly share your credentials, your reasoning, and uh, and and some of your 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 experience and expertise that you felt qualified you, not to mention the fact that we had a great time reviewing Olivia's together. Oh, yes, that's true. Well, it's been a long time. I, ha- I should have probably brought up that email that I sent you <laughs> to remember what I said. But I do, I can say that uh, I come with, from, uh, first of all, my career is uh, I'm a music educator, mu- professional musician by trade. I teach in a high school. So I uh, am a band director, orchestra director, musical conductor, um, Side note, I will get to see that video of you in Greece from your high school someday. <laughs> um, also from your neck of the woods up here in, in uh, central New Jersey area. And uh, I've had a lot of experience with uh, you know music and musical different musical styles uh, throughout my career. Uh, quite a bit of which have overlapped into the background music that you hear in the parks, uh, especially Disney Hollywood Studios. But of course, uh, I also expre- express my my love of the Star Wars franchise and especially the music because my love of Star Wars and my love of music kind of came about at the same time. I was six years old when Star Wars came out and when I started playing violin. So um, I became very uh, interested in both of these things and to have a, something that where both of these passions can walk the same path is uh, really awesome. So, and there's so much, I also being a Muppet fan, also being a Disney fan in general, just to be able to uh, talk about the music within this particular park, which is my favorite park of the, of, of them all. Although I love them all pretty much equally, except this one's a little bit better <laughs> in my opinion. And so I think we, that's, I think we first met, right. Didn't, didn't I give you and your family a tour like yes, way, way back um, yes, we're going back a we, long, long time. That was a yes. My daughter was probably ten or eleven or twelve now, and now she's twenty seven and working <laughs> as a caricature artist in Disney. So, um, you know, so, so yeah, it's been a long time. But that was a wonderful tour. That was that was fantastic. And then uh, we got on this call, and your video popped up, and I looked on the shelves behind you at all of your vintage Star Wars collectors collections, both in and sadly for me, it freaks me out a little bit out of the box. You're like, yeah, I take everything out of the box. I'm like, well, you're doing it wrong, clearly. But I love the uh, I love the shelves full of collectibles. Thank you, thank you. It's a it's a lifelong collection, but I am getting to be a I am getting into your your uh, neck of the woods where I'm slowly starting to part with some of it, purge some of the collection, um, mainly to make room for new collections, but, right. <laughs> but also but also to, you know, thin things out so that we have, you know, income to go down to Disney World uh, an extra t- a couple of times now that our daughter is living down here. So it's uh it's it's not the quantity of collectibles it's it's the the quality and the memories and that that we associate with at least that's what i tell exactly. myself so yes well yes. i'm excited for disney's hollywood studios um like you i have a uh, an affinity specifically for the music of this park and i think we're going to approach it the same way we have the other parks uh, think of it really as a musical tour of disney's hollywood studios from the background music through the attraction themes and we could talk about our favorite sto- songs and backstories if any it's composers singers and, and why they're so important to us and integral to the story and you know along the way if you have uh, your own sense of nostalgia and memories that you want to share and how they Im- help immerse immerse us and the emotions we can talk about that too um you know it's hard because there is so much music my first thought when i first thought about doing these was the top 10 like songs from every park and I'm like Mangello you're kidding yourself and you're kidding the listener because it's impossible for that to happen and I figured one it, there's way too much there's way too much music to talk about and two it, it's almost unfair to try and rank because music is such a, a subjective such a personal and I think oftentimes an emotional thing and I think what's unique about Hollywood Studios too in terms of music is it's very different than Magic Kingdom and Epcot. We're not going to talk about, for the most part, familiar names like 
Sherman or George Wilkins or George Bruns. Like we're going to talk about music that in many cases is recognizable from movies and TV as well as decades of American standards. So it's interesting because I think, you know, I think Magic Kingdom has its own sense of familiar familiarity with music from movies we grew up watching as kids. Epcot is is unique to this park, but this one sort of is is different in terms of having experienced, I think, a lot of the music from this park before as opposed to compositions that are unique, especially as we turn to and, and look at some of the background music in the different lands. Yeah, I think one of the more interesting things as I was starting to think about this was that I remembered when we did Epcot, you know, if you haven't listened to the show, spoiler alert, but at the end of the show, we sort of all sort of circled back and said, okay, so what is the one song that really embodies Epcot for you? And again, spoiler alert, we all sort of agreed that it was Papillon, um, which is my heart song for Epcot. Um, and it's it was interesting because going into this, I feel like I didn't initially go into this maybe with the same level of enthusiasm because of exactly what you're saying. I don't know that I know these songs because they take me to Hollywood studios. I think it's kind of the opposite of Hollywood studios, right? They're sort of supposed to be transporting you out of the park experience and into something else. Um, so we'll get into all of that more, I'm sure as we're talking, but as you were saying what you were just saying, like it kind of reminded me of my thinking in the Epcot show that we recorded and how it, it felt so different going into this. Yeah. I, I, I feel like for me, it, the journey of Hollywood studios, first of all, it feels like if you're, in, if you, and to use Magic Kingdom as an example, what you did with the Magic Kingdom, like there's all the different lands. And to me, every land just conjures up a whole new set of memory, set of nostalgia. Uh, I agree with Lisa that sometimes the it's it's the reverse. Like the song takes you out of the park and into another memory. But for me, I've done, I've because I love this park so much that and my wife and I have gone here, came here on our honeymoon and we literally just spent the entire time just hanging out around the um, uh, Chinese theater area just to sit on, on the benches back when they had benches and listen to the wonderful uh, soundtrack of movies, mo like movie musicals mainly that we just adored. So now it all kind of, inter it's it's all intertwined in our minds. So, Yeah. And, you know, I always talk about, you know, imagine watching a movie that has no music in it. And there's there's sometimes you can find videos and there's there's ways to do it where the background music and the score is gone and it's very unsettling. And it's the same thing for the Disney parks. You know, imagine walking down Hollywood Boulevard and not hearing that familiar music. Like you it it's very weird and you realize that something is missing, right? It it's almost like this this white noise that's in the background that you might not be consciously paying attention to but is is so critical um because of what the music does right it's it's the nostalgia it's the memories it's the immersion it it's that connective tissue i think that that really more so than anything else ties it all together as as you walk through the different lands and the subconscious transitions that happen in between lands here, um, very different and almost less pronounced than walking through Magic Kingdom. But when you think about the music in Hollywood studios, right, if you were sort of just close your eyes, what's the first thing that you think of when I say music in Hollywood studios? What's the first thing that comes to mind, Lisa and Will? So, I mean, admittedly, the first thing that comes to mind is just big band music. Um, as you're walking in the front door. And I don't know if I would name that sing, sing, sing or in the mood or anything else, but it's it's just big band, whether you're walking in the front gate to the sort of reimaginings of some Disney favorites to a big band theme or, or walking down Hollywood Boulevard. Um, as much as I would like to say that it's some of the more specific stuff that I can name, um, the first thing that comes to mind is just big band. I have to agree. Uh, big band all the way, uh, I think that 1940s style. That's definitely the Hollywood. You know, we're we're meant to, you know, have feelings of or what did it used to be called the Hollywood that never was and always will be. You know, but that's kind of where we're where we're at. From the minute you land on you know land on the Skyliner or pull in with a bus or even drive in, you're hearing that 
big band sound from Dis- of Disney music, which is that unique to this park or is it to or do you know if they're if the I'm talking about outside the gates, those friend like me, bibbity bobbity boo. I've never heard them anywhere from, else. I believe and correct me if I'm wrong, Lou, that those mixes are were originally in Shanghai. So, uh, um, yeah, I, so, I, I, I think that the big band, or at least the version of the big band remixes okay. that you hear, are also in Shanghai Disney. Yeah, yeah, that regard. That's fantastic. That when they changed that over, I was thinking, oh my god, this is this is so great in that it's taking, it's giving me that Disney flair, and and but it's putting it in a, in a way that I could kind of you know get caught up in the nostalgia of the nineteen that nineteen forties Hollywood, and then you cross through the gates, and then we're into. Uh, this great, just big, big band, you know, I guess Andrew sisters kind of style of music, walking up Hollywood Boulevard. Then you turn on to sunset and there's different, slightly different ones. I just love it. We'll talk about, I know we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about the transitions a lot more, but to me, it just sort of feels like they're easing you in, in a very sort of smart Disney way, because you're walking in the front gates to some very sort of familiar Disney hits that almost you don't realize right away that you're hearing them until yes. you realize that like you're hearing that line from the last I've seen the light or, Oh my gosh, I'm hearing that line from like never out of run like me. Um, and it's, you're, they're sort of like easing you in via Disney. And then once you're through the turnstiles, it's just full thirties and forties Yep. without right. that Disney touch, which I think is very intentional. Mm-hmm. And so, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I, well, go ahead. I'll get to mine in a minute. Well, mine what I was going to say, you know, a lot of what we're talking about, leads me to something that you know look the the like everything in the parks the music has changed slightly over time and and in this park really in in 2018 there was a a pretty big sort of across the park shift in the background music and again we we've heard music we, we hear music not just from the movies but in some places there's there's also more sort of period music but in January of 2018 Many people noticed that they removed a lot of the TV show themes that were prevalent there for years. And Disney came out and said, look, we're doing this on purpose because we really want you to feel like you are, and I quote, stepping into your own adventure. Because Hollywood Studios is a place where imagined worlds become real adventures to explore together. And as part of this revamp of the park they planned this adaptive background music score especially for hollywood boulevard and the hub of disney's hollywood studios so when you first enter the park you hear that that 1930s jazz era swing music but as you move closer to the chinese theater you start to hear more of the 40s music and what they did was they actually ended up it, they, they had to sort of make this transition seamless. As we talked about a lot of this seamless transitions, especially in places like Magic Kingdom, they created two separate arrangements of each song with two separate orchestras and orchestrations. And they hired a big band arranger by the name of Chris McDonald to arrange and record this mix and these overlapping background music scores. And so, and we'll talk about it as we, we go through, but much of the park, really most of the park, um, received this this new almost like overlay of music which probably was invisible to to most guests but if you have been familiar with the park you noticed that a lot of those tv and those movie scores that were not necessarily from disney movies per se but were prevalent in the park were gone but i think and and you guys tell me what you think i think that this new music definitely helps create a better sense of setting and time and place as Disney's Hollywood studios evolved from what was supposed to be this front lot back lot to this immersive storytelling experience. Yeah, Yeah, I I, I agree a thousand percent. And I think it completely makes sense with what they're doing and changing the, the vibe and the point of Hollywood studios, because when it was supposed to be a production area, it made perfect sense to have TV songs playing in the background, but that's exactly mm-hmm. what you don't want when you're, you know, when you're trying to transport someone um, into a different reality is to play, you know, obviously fictional music over topping over top. It kind of reminds me of WandaVision watching from the inside versus, <laughs> <laughs> right. versus on yeah. the outside. Yeah. The, the, the transition, as you mentioned, is, is, is really 
seamless. And, you know, I, and I enjoy, as I said, we enjoyed the, uh, basically what I called it the soundtrack loop. Right. And you also have to remember that when back then it was Disney MGM studios. So a lot of this, not all of it, but a lot of it were a, a, a mix of Disney music. Although at that point, I think a lot of that by the Chinese theater was a lot of, um, MGM or, or at least mm-hmm. musicals. I remember sound of music was in there. I remember, uh, Superman was in there. Um, and I remember, uh, singing in the rain, the trolley song, Dr. Zhivago. I mean, it was just, you know, a, a great mix of these things. And I enjoyed that, but yeah, that was a different part. That was a different kind of thing. So yeah, the come in through the the thirties and forties in Hollywood going down sunset. I did want to mention that, uh, I have to put, I have to point this out currently in, I think it's on sunset. You hear kiss me once, kiss me twice, kiss me. It's been a long time, which now just makes me think that's just Disney <laughs> trying to get Marvel in the parks and, you know, in, in a sneaky way <laughs> because it's the end of end game. I'm like, that's the exact, and, and, and you know, I, I, and I know, I think that's something that a lot of people would probably, well, they may not know any song in that whole loop. They'll know that one from that. So I, I love that. So spoiler alert. Um, it I, I I love that song. I have always loved that song. It's a 1945 Harry James song. Mm-hmm. You may not know this about me, and I probably shouldn't say it. I used to play the trumpet, and I love that song like since I was a kid. So when I hear it, first of all, I, I love that era of music, but I think it it is for some people, especially younger people, folks who might not know that music, it's some instant connective tissue, right? They're walking down Sunset Boulevard and they're like, wait a minute, I, I know that song. It's not like when you were at, on Commissary Lane and would hear a familiar movie or TV. They used to play a Harry Potter score, which yes. I always thought was odd. But that is connective tissue to a, a style and, and an era of music, which, you know, sadly is, is other than Sunset Boulevard, for a lot of people is has never been heard or, or long forgotten. All right. Right. So I, I just love that it's that it's there and, and it serves both as a transitional passing by kind of idea and setting the stage, setting the theme for you and for you to live your story. But at the same time, it, you know, it has it's still some of these a lot of these songs in some way or another will have a ring of familiarity um, with people, too. So and that actually also- is it, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So cor- correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's been a long, long played is only is it's been a long, long time is only played on Hollywood Boulevard, which only gets instrumentals. And again, that's like the progression again. So you're like sort of coming in with a hint of Disney. And then as you walk in, it's like the the really, really well known instrumentals. So you're sort of sort of subtly being taken in with sing, sing, sing. And it's been a long, long time and in the mood and the sort of big ones. And then as you turn down sunset, at least for me, it starts to get a little bit more niche. <laughs> like I happen to know all the words to Mary's Dotes because my grandmother <laughs> sang it to me all the time, but I think most people probably don't. And, but to be able to, cause when you start to go down sunset, you get lyrics, right? You get lyrics to some of the more, um, some of the, like maybe a little bit lesser known songs from the thirties and forties. Um, so you're kind of being taken a little bit deeper um, and a little bit less subtly than you're on Hollywood Boulevard with the instrumentals. Yeah. We'll talk about, cause there, there's even some of the songs that are, uh, there's also a shift in tone, I think, as you mm-hmm. go down Sunset, especially as you start to approach that big building at the end of the street. So, <laughs> and that the the wonderfully brilliant musical transition that that happens very subconsciously. But you 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 alluded to it earlier, and before you even step foot into the park in that main entrance area in 2018, is music that is adapted from a custom work that was created for Mickey Avenue in Shanghai Disneyland, which is, which are these big band arrangements of some of, you know, very familiar Disney tunes. Um, Any thoughts on some of the, you know, because for a lot of people, you know, you're rushing to get into the park or you you don't notice it until you're standing online waiting to get through security. Some of that, that BGM that's being played in that main entrance area. Well, I, I just, I just love have... it. Every time I hear it, it blows me away. I listened to this loop like again and again, just in the background as I was preparing for the show, along with lots of other loops. This is one of my favorite shows I've ever prepared for. Mm. Um, but just like the seamlessness with which one song transitions to the next, and you're not even quite sure if it's happened yet until you hear that hook for the next one. It's just so well done. It's so well done. It's like you're listening and you think you're listening to big band music. And then all of a sudden you hear like, let's go fly a kite. And 
It's wild. And, it's and I love fun. how they they take certain styles of certain famous big band composers, arrangers, orchestrators, and they kind of insert that into those those Disney themes. But I also appreciate the tempos. You know, you get off the bus, you get off the Skyliner, and you're just kind of, I just can't help but like do a little hop st- hop skip <laughs> to get into the park. Just but I and then and it's, and I'll also say that. On the occasion that I leave the park and I have to go back via bus, via Disney bus transfer, uh, I never am tired of. I don't care if there's a long line. But, but, you know, I'll say, "I'll wait. I'll take the next bus." I just love to sit there and listen to it. So, well, and I think too, for for guests having familiar Disney songs integrated into that style of music is this this musical segue that they're able to make sort of in their their minds whether they're coming from another park or coming off a bus or coming off the 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 skyliner it allows them to sort of transition into and when you step foot through the gates much like you do magic kingdom you are transported back in time you know that it's a very powerful yet subtle transition that happens as you walk under the the train trestle in magic kingdom and you step foot to the turns of the century, middle America here, where you walk through that gate and you are transported back to Hollywood in the late thirties and forties is, is that same type of transition that happens, not just visually, but uh, musically as well. And on Hollywood studios, you know, we talked about, again, this music that was custom arranged specifically for Hollywood studios, those big band instrumental arrangements from of popular songs from the 30s and 40s that they had to record multiple times. Again, Hollywood Studios went through this transition of celebrating the music from the movies from a long period of time to now music and and music from the movies through a number of decades too, right? There There was music from movies from the 50s. There was the overture from Oklahoma and then there was... Chariots of Fire and Pirates of the Caribbean, Curse of the Black Pearl and Magnificent Seven and Gone with the Wind and the theme from Dallas. Like I remember Dallas as a kid. I was like, wow, this is a really odd thing. Odd choice. Yes. Yeah. But <laughs> the, the, you know, when the in the in the late 80s, when the park first opened in early 90s, when the focus and the emphasis was on movies and, and TV and even the attractions. Right. Remember Superstar Television and a lot of these things. Yeah. These songs were you know, iconic, um, not necessarily Disney properties or even MGM properties, right? I sort of mentioned the uh, Harry Potter and Chariots of Fire and and Ben-Hur, but it, I I think the intent even now with the music that's there is it sort of starts to wind you up and excite you and get you sort of transitioned into the sentimental nostalgic adventurous storytelling adventure that you're about to step into in in the studios yeah getting ready to live your adventure you know live your story and that and i want and i find it interesting too that you know as you go up hollywood boulevard into the little hub there and then let's say you're going right to chinese theater to ride now mickey and minnie's runaway railway uh, the music in there, in the queue for that ride, I feel is almost, it, it's, if you're not really listening, you might think you're still listening to the queue from outside. You've got this 1930s, early 40s style of music that then kind of blends into like very classic movie score style of music. I'm not sure if it's all written for, I think it's all written for the the new Mickey Mouse cartoons which I love. I mean, I absolutely love the scores for all of those. I just think it's brilliant. It's like right out of the 19, right out of 1930s Mickey Mouse, but then adding, you know, the new, some of the new tropes that, that are, you know, depending on the, the movie, the, the, the shorts that you're watching, but I definitely feel that it's, it transitions into that beautifully right into nothing can stop us now. So. And the only the only sort of loss with Runaway Railway is some of the great music that we had inside Great Movie Ride, right? You know, by oh a waterfall God. from foot like parade, singing in the rain, uh, Chim Chim Cherry, Sorcerer's Apprentice, um, you know, classic. Although you know, 
I'm sure some kids were like, who's the guy swinging on the vine? I don't understand. And the guy in the trench coat and the hat. But I, I did I did love a lot of that music that, you know, fortunately, unfortunately, was was just it was sacrificed for Runaway Railway. Right, right. It was I, it was our favorite ride. And as sad as we are to see it go, uh, I to see it not be there anymore. You know, I absolutely do love the, the new attraction as well. Uh, I'm one that thinks can, you know, could have both existed somewhere, but I also feel like, you know, I just celebrate what we have, but the, the, yes, the original soundtrack from even the soundtrack, when you went into the movie theater, you know, and you were watching the uh, coming attractions. I mean, a lot of that was not just music. It was also, you know, the, it was, it was the trailers. It was the trailers mm-hmm. for all those great movies. And then you'd go in and, and I love the hooray for Hollywood. Um, set up that they started and going in and just connecting foot like parade singing in the rain all the way through just a you know it's it, it's it, it, it's all the feels all the all the nostalgic feels for us lisa anything from hollywood boulevard before we make a right turn onto sunset no i mean i just i'm glad you mentioned hooray for hollywood itself because to me like losing that song with the great movie ride was 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 such a tragedy we we closed on our house august 11th 20 20- 2017 and great movie ride closed two days later. Um, so I'm very sad that we didn't get to live here with it for longer. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, so you just, Oh, you moved, our- <laughs> you moved there and then they closed. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> My condolences. <laughs> That's bad timing. So I, I will say I've had worse timing with moves. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, um, I, I will tell you in advance that I absolutely love of, of all lands and, and areas of Disney's Hollywood studios. I, I have a particular affinity for Sunset Boulevard, not just because of the dining options that are available or the attractions that are on it, but because of, of the music that that swing, that 30s, 40s jazz and, and the big band music. Um, like you said, some of it is not just instrumental, but there's there's, you know, there's sing along songs that are there, which is which has these beautiful orchestral accompaniments. And you I really think that you get it really helps to set such a, a place and time and this feeling that you really have stepped back into old Hollywood. Right. It's like Magic Kingdom. Right. In terms of of the, the theme being so well designed and implemented using all of the the different senses um and we talked about some of the music and, and how it changes right it's been a long time the harry james boogie woogie bugle boy by the andrew sisters like i'm not gonna <laughs> it say how old i am but like i remember growing up like hearing uh, now i didn't grow up when the when the song first came out but i remember because this was like a post right after post world war ii song but I remember the Andrew sisters and falling in love with this type of music. Benny Goodman, you, you, at least you mentioned Sing, 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 In the Mood by Glenn Miller, Getting Sentimental Over You by Tommy Dorsey, More Harry James with Sleepy Lagoon, Duke, Elegan, Duke Ellington's Don't Get Around Much Anymore. It's interesting because you can almost sort of depending on where you are and the way you walk down Hollywood, right? Same way you walk down Main Street USA, you're sort of moving forward in time. Something different, right. a different transition happens here because as you move forward down Sunset uh, towards this looming Twilight Zone, you know, the Tower Hotel in the distance, that upbeat music starts to get slightly more melancholy as you get closer to the hotel, like the atmosphere changes in the most subtle way, unless you're sort of consciously listening for it. And I think it's just brilliant in terms of whoever sort of made the the choices and how and where to lay the music out on sunset was absolutely brilliant. We're obviously keeping a uh, rock and roller coaster and, and that, <laughs> that side of Gower street off, you know, this, this conversation, but that straight shot shot down sunset has some of the most beautiful music. And I think one of the most intelligent, subtle transitions in any of the parks anywhere. Agreed. Uh, I love, and plus I love the setting that is going on on sunset. You know, obviously you're in a, you're transported, as you said, in a different time, a different place, but everything about that from the stores to the places you eat all the way down that that walkway, the 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 architecture, it all 
kind of reeks of the 1930s, you know, and then you keep going and then you, and you have to, I mean, if you're going to wait online to go in line for um, the attraction that is at the end of that space, you are all of a sudden getting a similar vibe, but with one very notable difference. And that is this introduction of reverb or echo as if it's not quite, you're walking along and it's not quite there. Maybe it's in the other room or like it's like a dream and you're kind of hearing it in the background and it has this very unsettling feeling. And and the music is beautiful. It's, it's, it's still part of that same time period, but it just makes you, it goes from a nostalgic feeling to an eerie feeling. Yeah. The air, yeah. the air just changes as you yeah. move into that space. There's just something about the the vibration of the, the air in in that area as, Absolutely. as starting to change. Um, let me know when we're allowed to start talking about tower. <laughs> <laughs> Can we start? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, you know, I think it's it's the perfect time, and and you know, Lisa, we've we've had a chance to experience Tower and and that part of Hollywood Studios for an event th- that we did years ago when when we had a very uh, we had a small group event with like twenty five people at the Twilight Zone Tower Hotel Tower Hotel after hours. Yes, I need to do this again because it was that good, but you were able, the music was so much more pronounced because it it didn't have that sort of cacophony of, of voices around it. And it really, you're right, it takes a, a slightly eerie setting, which, and, I, and if you walk through, if you walk through the extended queue at golden hour and the misters are on and there's that little bit of smoke and you hear that music, man, it is a wonderfully creepy vibe. But go ahead, t- take take us to the tower. So I, first of all, the music sounds almost like it's being played on an old r- record player. Like it has that that vibe, like even the transmission of the music has changed, which changes, of course, the quality of it and transports you that much more into the environment of Tower. But like the Tower Q loop, man, <laughs> like where do we even start? Like if there's a loop that I put on in my house, if I'm just trying to like get stuff done or relax or study or take a nap. I don't know. Like (laughs) it's that tower loop and it's just so beautiful. And the rendition of we'll meet again that they chose to use by Vera Lynn from 1939 is just such a stunning piece of music. And like the way that if you know the song, I don't know if I can get into it now, but the the song we'll meet again by Vera Lynn, which is, (laughs) you know, was originally about soldiers in the war and saying that we'll be back together soon when you get back takes on a very different meaning as we're walking into this haunted space about to encounter the the ghosts, the spirits from, from what happened in 1939. So I'll let you guys go to your back and just talk <laughs> about the tower loop forever. <laughs> oh no. I love that you mentioned the, uh, the quality of sound, not just in the echo, but yeah, like it's it, as if it's been being played on a phonograph, you know, and if you've ever had an actual phonograph, even not even a record player, but a phonograph where you have to crank it, you know, that, and, and you get that very pointed speaker sound that's very tinny mm-hmm. and you put out, you put out that along with the echo that goes with it, but yet man, they managed to fill it. You no, know, in, in an ordinary circumstance, that would just kind of be right in front of you and that would be it, but they have it filling all the space and it just, I mean, just knocks you, knocks you silly. And, you know, if you get, it just gets you into that, into that mood of what, you know, especially if you know what's coming. Um, and yeah, I love that you mentioned we'll meet again. Um, I love Mood Indigo, Duke Ellington as another one from there uh, that I absolutely love it. And a lot of these are not as well known. These are lesser known. Uh, I don't even want to say, you know, like jazz, big band, swing standards, again, from the 1930s um, that just, you know, set the, they just set, set the mood, set the the story going. So, yeah, I think some of the, the, the Ellingtons and the, the Miller, the Glenn Miller songs are recognizable, right? And those are the ones that sometimes will catch people's ears, like a dog, like, oh, yeah, I mean, I know that song, I've heard that song, but even like the Fats Waller music and mm-hmm. some of the the Frankie Newton songs, uh, and and like, I, I'm so grateful for things like Spotify because so many smart, caring, musically inclined people have, have gathered together um, playlists of the music that you can find from Tower of Terror. So you can, you can, I'm sure you can find not just the attraction music there, um, which, you know, is its own sort of iconic 
theme from the TV show, but a lot of that period music you can find on, on playlists uh, on Spotify and, and is definitely worth a listen. Uh, and I think will make you appreciate the the land and the attraction even more. And yeah, then if we want to go past the queue, I don't know if we're... Go wherever you need to oh. go. Go ahead. But just, I mean, just it's worth mentioning once we're on the attraction itself. Obviously, there's sort of a frantic nature to the music that builds and builds as you go. But also, there's some really cool, like, horror movie throwbacks, like Jaws and the the sound from Psycho, um, you know, as you're in sort of the the climactic moments of of the attraction that are such cool throwbacks that I know, at least for me, like I didn't notice, I like my subconscious noticed them in the moment, I'm sure, but like, I wasn't aware that I was hearing them until I had a check, chance to process it afterwards. So I think that's just another like really cool subliminal throwback. And of course the Twilight Zone theme, the Twilight Zone, you can't have this, this attraction without that, right. you know, and, and just, you know, setting it, but, but, but used perfectly. Now, not overdone, just just a little bit, and and not all at once. Like hearing a little doom, 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 ding, ding, doom, 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 like all the way through little moments, and just setting the eeriness. You, and it's especially fun if you when you've never done it before. You don't know what to expect, you know. But even when, but even after after your first after your first uh, stay at the Hollywood Tower, um, it's still just as wonderful. So, right, because there's the there's the the Twilight Zone TV theme, and then there's the the there's a Richard Bellis Tower of Terror theme, which right. sampled a lot of that opening um, that opening theme music from the TV show from the from the fifties. Gotta say though, uh, as awesome as it is, as much as I love it, I really would have liked to have seen a Mel Brooks theme there. I heard you know. <laughs> I know. Let me let's not go down a very long road that I can. My love for, for Mel Brooks goes very wide and very deep. History of the World yes, Part Two. I'm too. looking for you. So, yes. um, yeah. What what could have been? I know we talked what about that on on a on a past show. On another. Um, but I think we should just obviously mention across the way down uh, down the street is is Rock and Roller Coaster and Rock and Roller Coaster Courtyard. Uh, every single song is by Aerosmith, at least for now. Um, mm. Who knows how that may change in um you know the future this this idea that we're sort of walking into this music festival and and live versions of the songs by aerosmith mixed in with the the crowd sounds give us gives us the sense that something bigger and and live is going on anything you want to add about you know rock and roller coaster and or aerosmith i just mentioned before we even started recording um it might be cool to to mention the backstory that sort of ties supposedly ties the very modern looking rock and roller coaster into its unlikely neighbor tower of terror um the idea that g-force records which is the production studio where all this is supposedly taking place was supposedly an operating and very successful studio back in the 1930s and some of the executives were actually at the party um where the lightning strike happened at the tower and somehow managed to escape and then fell on hard times because of the reputation of the area. And then apparently like once tower quote unquote reopened in 1994, it sort of brought business with it to G force as well. And they became this like burgeoning record company again, and were able to recruit bands like Aerosmith. So, so I thought that was cool. And I think our friend Jim Corcus for that story. That's and a, what I love awesome. about that, right, is is you can't sort of find that story anywhere. You have to either hear it or have it paid forward to you or somehow try and piece the those elements together very quickly, just without going too far and too deep. If and or when Aerosmith is no longer the 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 house band at Rock and Roller Coaster, what band or what music or what would you like to hear? from a music perspective, be put in, in that attraction. I'd kind of like to see it turn into more of a generic music festival thing and not be associated with one artist so that you can kind of, you know, IE what's going on with uh, guardians of the galaxy mission breakout or not mission breakout. Sorry. Guardians of the galaxy cosmic rewind. Uh, because uh, I feel like that way you have the ability to rotate in and out different artists from different time frame, different time periods. And, uh, I, you know, I think it's kind of, 
it's it's I don't know. I I would have a hard time trying to think of an, a single artist. I mean, I'm sure maybe Lisa has a, has a good idea, but I I can't think of one that I would want to put in there in place. It's got to be something that's timeless yet not something that people don't, don't really know anymore. Um, case in point, uh, I had my marching band down on a trip a few years back, and I had one student in the, from my drum line who was in line to get ice cream, and he got his ice cream. And a gentleman came up to him and said, hey, man, where'd you get the ice cream? And he said, oh, just over there. And the guy said, hey, thanks, man. And he walked over. And then all of his older, he was a freshman, his senior friends in the drum line were looking at him like, you idiot. That was Steven Tyler that just asked you where, <laughs> where, where to get ice cream. So the kid didn't. And then a kid, of course, who's Steven Tyler? So, you know, there oh, you go. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Supposedly he has a house down here and he actually goes to the parks like – not for a PR thing or a press thing. Like he goes because he's actually like a Disney fan. Yeah. yeah that's, I think that's what, it, that's why I was there. So yeah, he's definitely a fan and like just awesome with people when he, when he comes into the parks, he probably yeah. comes in super incognito. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. It's funny. You, you said that. Cause as I was, I was thinking that this question would probably come up and I was trying to think of what my answer would be. And I too started thinking, oh, wouldn't it be cool if we did something guardians like, or it's like you get on kind of not knowing what you're going to get. Um, I know everybody, so many people want a power line retheming. I heard about that. Yeah. That would be cool. If that's your thing. Um, I mean, I go from like green day to journey in ACDC. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know like what, like I, that's why I'm like guardians is my go-to because like, I would love to hear green day on there, but I would love to hear journey too. And I would like, like there's, I don't know. I just, I think just so you know, there's some kids going right now, mom, who's green day. What's a green day? <laughs> so if you don't think that you're old, you just talked about Green Day as if they were like a current band. So well, they're on Beat Saber, so I think people <laughs> <laughs> And now she's quoting Beat Saber as her <laughs> her frame of relevance, just so you know. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think I, I like the idea of you know, for some people, especially early on, they were like, Well, we need more they wanted more IP. They wanted more Disney IP in Disney's Hollywood studios. We now have obviously gotten that with Toy Story and Guardians and and even, you know, a little bit with the Incredibles and Lightning McQueen Racing Academy, which which I have no idea how it sits in the shadow of the Tower of Terror, but that's okay. We suspend our disbelief. I think the idea, and I think from a guest satisfier point of view, if you change some of the, the decor on the inside, or maybe you're not going through the freeway, it does give you the opportunity to change music up, whether it comes from, you know, Disney Pixar films or it can go, you know, current or, you know, however far back you need it to go. Um, having that surprise element to it. And look, there's a, it, it, there's a huge rewritability. We are completists by heart, right? I need to ride Guardians again until I get all six songs. I've written Guardians a lot of times. I still have not gotten Everybody Wants to Rule the World someday it'll happen so there you go but all right let's move from sunset because i could and obviously oh, we got company hey, wow hey. all right how do people all right. hey don't mind us we'll be finished in just a minute hey, yeah hey, what? Hey. What? What? what's a hey hey, hey. hey. How what are you, are you guys still doing here you're supposed to be at a show now That concludes part one of our virtual visit and musical tour of Disney's Hollywood Studios. Be sure to tune in next week as we complete our tour through the rest of the park, going all the way through to Galaxy's Edge and wrapping it up with some conversation, conclusions, and maybe predictions for what may be coming musically to the studios. I would love for you to be part of that conversation and talk about this week's show over in the clubhouse at www.radio.com slash clubhouse. Time for our Walt Disney World Trivia Question of the Week, where I invite you to test your knowledge, not just of Walt Disney World's history, but the details of what you see, hear, taste, or remember. If you think you know the answer, you can enter for a chance to win a Disney prize package. This week's trivia contest is once again brought to you by you. Because if you are part of or want to join the WDW Radio Nation family, you help bring every episode of the show to life, all the live broadcasts, the contests, the events, the giveaways, they're all thanks to you. 
You can find out how you can help the show for as little as a dollar a month by going to www.radio.com slash support. There you'll also find out details about some of the exclusive rewards you can get every month, including scavenger hunts, group video calls, our private Facebook group, monthly care packages, early access and discounts to special events, and much more. You can also learn out how and why a portion of your contribution goes to our Dream Team project to benefit the Make-A-Wish Foundation of America. I want to thank some new and longtime members, including Jonathan, Daniel Boyd, Giovanni Palladino, Elizabeth Stuckman, and Ashley Scarpa. None of this happens without you, and I appreciate your friendship, support, and help. Again, to find out more and to join the nation, you can visit www.radio.com slash support. Now, before we get to this week's question, we're going to go back, review last week's, and select our winner. So last week, I asked you to identify where in Walt Disney World you could hear this phrase. I'm putting my somewhat radio announcer voice on when I do it. This is KNRG News Radio. Hey, let's check the weather report and see if it's going to stay way cool outside. That is, of course, Ellen's Energy Adventure, where the announcer turns it over to weatherman Willard Scott. Corey Burton, by the way, is the voice of the radio announcer. Anyway, I took all the correct entries, randomly selected one, and once again, last week we were playing for a WW Radio mug, a pin, and a mystery prize. And last week's winner, randomly selected, is William Beck. So, William, congratulations. I will get your prize package out to you right away. If you played last week and didn't win, that's okay because here's your next chance to enter in this week's Walt Disney World Trivia Challenge. So Sunday, January 22nd, 2023, marked the final night of Splash Mountain in Frontierland in Walt Disney World. Moment of silence. So of course, I wanted to use Splash Mountain as the subject of this week's trivia contest, because there are, or well, were, three Splash Mountains in Disney parks around the world. Walt Disney World, Disneyland, and Tokyo Disneyland. Your challenge this week is to simply tell me what order they opened in. You have until Sunday, January 29th at 11.59 p.m. Eastern to go to www.radio.com, click on this week's podcast. There you'll find the online form to enter. Once again, you're going to be playing for a chance to win a pin, a mug, and a mystery prize. So good luck and have fun. That's going to do it for this week's show. Hope you enjoyed part one of our virtual musical tour of Disney's Hollywood Studios. Join us next week as we pick up part two, finish our tour. But in the meantime, I'd love to hear from you. We finished off talking about Rock and Roller Coaster, possibly in the future, not starring Aerosmith. Who would you replace Aerosmith with? An individual band, a number of different bands. What is your idea? Come share your suggestion and be part of the community and conversation over in the WW Radio Clubhouse on Facebook at www.radio.com slash clubhouse. Talk not just about this week's show, but anything in the Disney, Marvel, and Star Wars universe. It is warm, welcoming, friendly, and family-friendly, and I would love to invite you to be part of the community. You can also connect with me elsewhere on social. I am at Lou Mangiello on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. Be sure and like the WW Radio page on Facebook at facebook.com slash WW Radio. Turn on notifications so you don't miss a thing, including our Wednesday night WW Radio live show. Whether I'm out and about in the parks or cruise line or Disneyland or broadcasting live from the home studio, you can be part of the live show. We'll discuss not just this week's podcast, but what's going on in and around Disney, Marvel, and Star Wars news. There's also trivia contests, 20 questions, my Disney Plus pick of the week, your questions, an opportunity to call in and be part of the show, and much more. Again, every Wednesday, 7.30 p.m. Eastern at www.radiolive.com. If you have a question you'd like me to answer on an upcoming episode, you can email me, lou at www.radio.com. Or if you want to be heard on the air, you can call the voicemail line at 407-900-9391. That's 407-900-WDW1. Call in with a comment about this week's show, a question, or just a hello from the parks, and I will play it on the air. For example, stay tuned right after this segment for some of your voicemails. Please visit www.radio.com. There you can find not only all of our show notes, past episodes, but thousands of blog posts from our incredible team of writers also visit our events page where you can find out about the next meet of the month in walt disney world our next group cruise which is going to be april 
for an eight-night cruise on the Disney Fantasy with an overnight in Bermuda. We also do group adventures by Disney, and I'm going to be announcing some upcoming events very, very soon. Please visit LouMangelo.com. Find out how I can help you turn what you love into what you do with one-on-one mentoring, individual coaching, consulting, join our weekly mastermind group, or if I can come to speak to your business, your conference, your event, or your school. I have a number of different customizable keynote presentations that I can speak to, including leadership lessons we can learn from Walt Disney, what your business can learn and implement from the Disney parks, and how to achieve that ultimate customer experience. I also have a number of presentations specifically geared towards schools, students, faculty, as well as new and social media, including building your brand with live video, the importance of community, and specific, actionable, practical, and tactical social media strategies for your business and industry. Again, you can find out more and reach out to me directly by going to lumangelo.com. There you can also find out about my upcoming Momentum Retreat coming up this April, as well as my Momentum Weekend Workshop in Walt Disney World coming up this fall. Thanks, as always, to Mouse Fan Travel, my official and recommended travel provider, no matter where you are going, in not just the Disney World, but anywhere on this big, blue, beautiful planet of ours. You can visit mousefantravel.com. They are my official and recommended travel provider. It's who I've used for more than 18 years. More importantly, it's who I trust and recommend to you. Again, visit them over at mousefantravel.com. And as always, my friend, and you are my friend, whether we have met yet or not, all I ask is that if you like the show, please help spread the word. If you're enjoying this episode, take a screenshot of it on your phone. Share it on social. Tag me at Lou Mangello. I'll reshare it follow you back. If you can, take just a couple of seconds to rate and review the show on Spotify or over an Apple podcast. If you can leave a review, I'd really appreciate it. I'd like to thank some recent reviewers like Ray, who says it's a fun and informative podcast as Lou brings passion and enjoyment on all things Disney, making the time between trips much more endurable. His care for his listeners. You're not a listener. You're my friend. But thank you. Shines through. And as a friend, you are waiting to meet. I hope we can in the future. Keep it up, Lou. Thank you so very much for that. I I sincerely appreciate you taking the time to listen, to share, to invite friends, to be part of the community and choosing and being the good, being an example of kindness and patience and generosity to others, not just in our immediate community, but my hope is that the show puts a smile on your face, brings a little bit of Disney magic to you wherever you are, and maybe even inspires a little bit of positivity that you can pass on to someone else. I hope that this is your best week ever. If there's ever anything I can do to help you, to thank you, please reach out to me and let me know. I hope to see you in the community, on social, and this Wednesday on WW Radio Live. So until next time and next week, have a great week. See ya. Hi, Lou. It's Tom Free calling from Manhattan. Um, I recently returned from my first uh, uh, trip back to Walt Disney World since shortly before the pandemic. And because I discovered WDW Radio during the pandemic, I just wanted to call and say how everything you do truly enhanced my experience in the parks to a, to a very unexpected degree. I knew it would, but I didn't, I didn't know how much. Um, Disney information is, is great, but it's, it's also very plentiful. And uh, what drew my attention to you from the start was your enthusiasm and your commitment and candor, um, and of course your positive attitude. Beyond bringing certain wonderful things to the front of my consciousness that, that otherwise I think would have definitely been under my radar, um, I was really surprised at how differently I look at the parks now and everything in them thanks to you. I've, I've been a, a diehard Disney fan since childhood, uh, but this was a real paradigm shift for me. I, I, uh, I never thought I would, I'd need to be sort of rejuvenated about Disney World, you know, I didn't, I didn't need it, need, need that at all, really. But now I kind of think I did need it. It's exactly what I did need. It's like when you have a, a teacher that sort of changes how you look at everything and, uh, can make something very familiar seem totally new again. And I just don't think that that could have happened without all those qualities, uh, that you, that you bring to the community that, uh, that I mentioned before. Uh, not to mention all your years of experience. And to be able to do that in a cry- crowded field like Disney and Disney Podcast is, is quite amazing. So uh, I thank you sincerely for that, Lou, and uh, thanks also also to your colleagues and family for their contributions and the community, and especially Becky, uh, who really brings a great 
great perspective, very uh, very articulate, very intelligent perspective, um, and a fun perspective anytime she's on with you. So thanks again, and congratulations on your 700th. I hope there'll be many, many more. Bye. Hi, this is Alexis Gill from Ocala, Florida. I was calling in. Uh, forgive me. I am behind on listening to the podcast, but I just listened to episode 690, which was top 10 um, Walt Disney places and places that you would want to redeem. And you guys mentioned the NBA experience and that building being so huge and, you know, what to do in that space. And I have a two-year-old son, and it just came to light something that I think Disney Springs needs so badly, and that is a kid's space for a, a playground of some sort. Um, I, I actually want to reference, I grew up near St. Louis, and there is a building there that's called the City Museum, and it sounds very boring, but it is not. It is a multi-story old shoe factory, I believe, that um, they made into a multi-story playground. Um, you can literally climb on everything. It's you know made of recycled um, material, so it's it's economically friendly. There's a 10-story slide within the building, and I just think something like that would be a great thing to have in Disney Springs. Uh, it would facilitate families going there, obviously, more, uh, being able to have a lunch reservation and then let your kids, you know, expel some energy specifically on rainy days at, at Disney World. Um, there's not a lot of indoor spaces that provide, you know, kids an area to expel some energy. So I just think that that would be great. You could put a cafe in it. You could put a bar in it for, you know, uh, adults to indulge as well while their kids go play. I just think it would be something that that would be great and sorely needed in the uh, Disney Springs area. So thank you for all that you do, uh, Lou, and and always enjoy the the podcast, and I hope everyone has a magical week. Thank you. Hey, Lou. Mangello is Patrice Roberti from Boston, Mass. I had to call you back. It is Monday morning. Last night I was listening to episode number 668, Tomorrowland Part 2, and you were talking to about to Kendall Foreman, and several times you guys mentioned Wally. I figure you had to have heard that Wally is coming out in a Criterion edition in November, and yes, I have also already pre-ordered it. I hope that then or before then you will get Kendall back on. She obviously loves Wally the way I think you do and the way I know I do, and I hope you do I thought, a two-segment podcast about Wally. I mean, everything, his incredible hopefulness and curiosity on a deserted planet how he's not a schlub he's 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 mean to mo he gets irritated so he's not just a schlub he, he him and eve dancing outside flying outside the axiom i mean so beautiful so incredibly beautiful and then that ending i mean that astonishing ending when wally's when his love and his devotion they save him. They, I'm going to cry. You can tell I'm going to cry. Anyway, I sure hope you do a show about Wally. I don't know what the topics could be. You could just go from scene to scene and say why they're beautiful and amazing and why he's not human. He's not even real. And he's so human and so real. And I know you know that, so you can tell I'm crying. I, I hope you do something about Wally. You love it so much. Please, please talk more about him because it's a great movie. And as I said to you once a, a, a couple of weeks ago, people either don't know it or just think it's another Pixar. It's not, and it deserves a criterion. It's getting a, the first animated film, apparently, to get a criterion um, um, uh, collection showing. So I hope you do something with that. Take care. Bye. Happy week. Oh, and P.S., I had to call back. The people who call you and say how much you have meant to them, some of them over almost 20 years, they are amazing, and their calls are great especially the men who call you and tell you what you've meant to them. They get me every time. I get misty. So God bless them all. God bless you.